Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's probably like I don't know. Is it on? Almost verbatim. Oh, yeah. I know. Yeah. Do you think that still exists? Okay. How's that? I can look. I wrote the dangerous dog section. Medium. Is that good for sound? The dangerous dog section. I can see. You're responsible for that. We just did potentially dangerous. Potentially dangerous, dangerous. Good evening. We're going to get started with our listening posts for the evening. Um, we'd like for this to feel informal, so uh, please feel free to get up and speak to each other if you'd like to. Um, today's subject is whether to approve the elimination of a pit bull ban from our dangerous dog ordinance. Our purpose for holding the listening post is primarily to afford the City Council an opportunity to witness the exchange of information from individuals who have first-hand knowledge on a subject, how individual council members receive or use the information presented is up to them, but it's been a great process for us, for council members to see a, a, a larger um, expanse on, on knowledge and topics that they're going to consider in the future. The um, second reason for the listing post is that typically when the council votes on a topic and there is interest from the community to speak to the council, if they come to a council meeting, it's a one-way conversation with them giving a presentation. It doesn't really afford a conversation or exchange of information. If we use social media, the subject can be taken off topic, comments can be taken out of context, or presenters can be attacked or criticized for their views. Um, information also might be presented that would not be accurate. So tonight's topic is one topic. We encourage everyone here to listen, honor each other, and share. Communities are about living in harmony, finding connections, and creating rules that protect our differences. I have copies of the ordinance available for your use. And to start, I would like to ask our panel to share a little bit about themselves your name, who you represent, and what your relationship or how you work with, with dogs, since that is our topic. We'll start at the end of the table down here. I think those mics work okay for the mic, Jason. Yeah, they're picking up for the live right now. All right. Thank you. <laughs> My name is April Moore. I'm the Chief of Animal Services with KC Pet Project, Animal Services Division. Uh, I am a recent transplant to Missouri. I've been here for about a year and a half. I come from uh, Central Texas originally. I've got about nearly two decades of work in animal welfare, specifically in field services and uh, engagement-focused uh, programming around animal welfare topics. Hi. I'm Katie Barnett. I'm an attorney in Kansas and Missouri, and um, my primary focus is animal law. And um, even narrower than that, dangerous dog ordinances and dangerous dog issues legislation and policy is a specialty of mine. I've worked with um, dozens of municipalities in the Kansas City metro area on this very issue. Um, traditionally repealing their breed specific language and enhancing the dangerous dog language that's behavior based um, is kind of what I do. Um, I also co-authored the International Municipal Lawyers Association Dangerous Dog Ordinance that's used across the country. Um, so, and then most of my clients are um, animal shelters or individuals uh, working on civil issues. I've also been a special prosecutor on animal cruelty issues. I'm Dr. Pete Rucker. I'm a veterinarian at Excelsior Springs Animal Clinic. I've been here for 44 years, and I provide the uh, I help the shelter and assistance with the animal control. Good evening. My name is Greg Dahl. I serve as the chief of police for Excelsior Springs. Uh, obviously, we are responsible for enforcing whatever 
Uh, ordinances are on the books, so I have an interest there. I am also a dog owner, dog lover, so um, I have a double interest. So. Hi, I'm Angela. I am pretty much a lifelong resident of Excelsior for the most part. Um, I don't have a career in dogs. I have lived with pit bulls and other dogs pretty much my entire life. Um, I really just have a vested interest in the safety of our community and the well-being of our residents. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so to start with, the, we have a dangerous dog ordinance that has two sections that pertain to pit, bull, pit bulls specifically. In the definition, there is um, is what's used in the ordinance to define what is meant by pit bull. And then there is a section in the ordinance that is a very small section that just, it bans pit bulls from the city limits. So the big question is, um, will our community still be protected if those two sections are eliminated from the ordinance? And what would be concerns that we should, we should address? the definition here to me is interesting because you have listed out some specific breeds the Staffordshire Bull Terrier the American Pit Bull Terrier traditionally there are three uh, one that Excelsior Springs is lacking is the American Staffordshire Terrier which I wouldn't advocate putting back in um, but then down here in your catch-all language that talks about basically any dog that looks like that, it does include the American Staffordshire Terrier. So it's like the American Staffordshire Terrier is not banned in its purest form, but if you have a dog that's mixed with an American Staffordshire Terrier, which is a unique breed, it is not a Staffordshire Bull Terrier and it's not an American Pit Bull Terrier. Anyway, the Pit Bull definition is uh, quite vague and um, poorly written, so it certainly would be great to just do away with that part. Of it. Also, um, I see under your first definition, section one of your definition of a dangerous dog, it says any dog that constitutes a physical threat to human beings or other animals, or has a disposition or propensity to attack, um, which it has traditionally in other jurisdictions been hard to define. Um, what does it mean to have a propensity to attack? How do you distinguish that from just simply existing as a dog? Um, and then um, a dog of a species which, uh, first, I don't think that makes sense, but a dog uh, due to size, vicious nature, or other characteristics, I don't know. I assume you are animal control. Yes, yeah. I, I do want to what is difficult about the ordinance for enforcement or issues they may have had to deal with? I would love to hear from them on how they deal, what, what does size mean to you and how do you determine size is a dangerous, size makes an animal dangerous? dangerous. but I do not I agree with you I do not feel that size means that this dog is dangerous so mm -hmm. I, I just would love to hear from both your animal control officers and um, Chief Moore as to what is enforceable when we're talking about enhancing public safety um, Angela uh, Angela mm -hmm. mentioned that she's very interested in public safety as a lifelong resident and I would just love to hear in your experience, what, how do you define that? What does that mean to you when you're out in the field every day and you're seeing dogs that have been people and, and exactly. been a danger to yeah. the community? It's definitely a case by case basis. So we can investigate animal bites, um, things that happen in like somebody's home, say, oh, somebody enters into the home and the dog bites them. Is, is the dog protecting its, is it doing what it's supposed to be doing or is it actually a dangerous dog? 
Um, a lot of things come to that. I mean, I'm just trying to figure this out here. Um, help me out here. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't understand. What I mean, makes like, a dog dangerous to you if you were to write an enforceable ordinance uh -huh. that isn't as vague as what you have? Okay. What would it say in your experience? Okay. Um, and maybe Chief Moore can talk to the, She's, yeah. I believe, been in many jurisdictions. What does that mean to you? What is a dangerous dog? So I think when we when we look at dangerous dog ordinances, what we're trying to get at is securing and ensuring public safety for our community. And the challenge with create specific ordinances and sort of rolling those into dangerous dog situations is one, identifying breeds visually is unreliable. And we know that breed doesn't predict behavior. So when we look at dangerous dog ordinances, we're looking at the, the elements that would inform whether or not we have a public safety risk and whether or not we need to put provisions in place that would protect the public. And so we're looking at things like history, the behavior during that incident. We're looking at, uh, we may be looking at general size of the animal because certainly a bite that plays yeah. into whether or not the incident itself um, and the, the bite received by the victim is you know, escalated. Uh, we're looking at the number of animals involved. We're looking at the, the degree of vulnerability that, that the victim presents. Right, exactly. And so it really is, to your point, it should be incident-based. Incident-based. Exactly. And also to your point, bites on property are, bites are bad, right? We, we are want bad. dogs exactly. to keep teeth yeah. to themselves yeah. for the most part, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. But bites on property and bites off property while animals are running at large are two different issues in your community. Exactly, yeah. And so mm -hmm. what we want to try to, to limit or mitigate are off property at large bites. Those are the bites that are going to put your public at risk. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so your dangerous dog mm -hmm. laws should be written in such a way that it addresses those specific issues. Exactly. So, uh, yeah. I don't know if you have anything you want to add or you all. Yeah. I, I agree, so, I mean, um, because I think there might be more witnesses when it's in the home or on property versus the nice sunny day and your dog gets out and it's left up it's to, to its own agenda and um, sometimes dogs that get off property and they're away from their owner, they're not nice. They're, they have, they can revert to different personalities. Um, Sometimes they're great, you know. Sometimes I pick up dogs and their owners are like, I don't know how you picked up my dog. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, but um, to address that, I mean, it is, it's definitely a case-by-case -case basis and a lot of things play into that. So if I come across a dog on its own property and it's growling at me, is it doing its job? If I come across a dog and it's in the street and it's growling at me, why is it growling at me? Um, is it able to be captured? Um, how hard do I have to work to capture this animal? Um, that could definitely play into deeming it dangerous because moving forward, yeah, fight or play, if, moving forward, um, if I wasn't there to do this job, would it attack somebody or bite somebody because they're trying to get this animal and they're just like rushing into it, you know, so lots of different things play into, into it, so, yeah. or citations based on um, repetitive bites from the same dog. Um, if a dog bites, we'll quarantine it or have a 10-day rabies observation. Sometimes the victim will sign a complaint for dangerous dog because of the circumstance under which the dog bit, if it was running at large or in a home or et cetera. But we have written dangerous dog citations to owners whose dogs have been once without provocation or more than once with or without provocation. So it just depends on the individual circumstances. Have citations been common for dog uh, incidences in our community?
never know what's going to arise, what's going to happen. So, I mean, I can't specifically say that. Have I written some? Yeah, a few. Sure. And sometimes those correct the issues, and sometimes we go further. So, yeah. I would say that from the professional standpoint with the AVMA and the MVMA, uh, they have they don't go into details like we need to be here, but all their recommendations are that there should be no breed specific, like just, you know, no breed or classification of animals should be pinpointed in, in any type of uh, legislation. They are for dangerous dog legislation, but they do not recommend that we pick out specific breeds. I was going to ask Christina to maybe elaborate on some of the challenges that they both encountered um, in enforcing the ordinance as it's written now. Absolutely. So um, probably within the past five years, emotional support animals, service animals has become huge. And um, dealing with that, you have to be careful what you say. Um, sometimes you can go out and you can get certificates for your animals off the internet, whether they are service dog or emotional support animals. I don't know how far to even push that. <laughs> um, but sometimes they still can get loose and sometimes they are treated, you know, not as such. <laughs> so that kind of stops us. Um, just going off a dog's looks and characteristics, I am not by any means a dog breed professional. So when it comes to looking like a pit bull or a pit bull terrier, American Staffordshire Terrier, um, you can have different crosses. You can have lab boxer mixes. You can have American Bulldog mixes. You can have all sorts of things. The burden of proof is on the city. So therefore, we would need to get DNA tests, things like that, um, that opens up a whole other can of worms that I don't believe we have the time for, nor does the city want to pay for that. So I kind of go by a case-by-case -case basis. A dog is a dog is a dog until it proves otherwise. I go to somebody's home and they say, yes, this is a pit bull terrier. Here's paperwork showing the vaccinations. It's a pit bull of whatever, whatever is in our ordinances. I'm sorry, you cannot have it legally here inside city limits. We'll work with them, give them time to remove the animal from city limits. Sometimes we go back and they have privacy fences up so we'll never find out what's in their yard. <laughs> so, I mean, there's so many different ways around this. Um, do I know that pit bulls are here? Absolutely. Um, again, it's a case-by-case -case basis. And if this animal is showing aggressive behaviors beyond, um, you know, property, territorial, things like that, I, I do expect a dog to protect its property. That's what it's for, and that's what it does. Um, but when um, it's so bad to where it's, creating um, a nuisance behavior for neighbors, getting out of its fences, things like that, then we're going to address it no matter what breed it is. So, yeah. My experience with working with the officers has written, this is impractical to enforce. They, they could be like that every single day, right? They could be one of the dogs were working with the police. There or some mixed breed. And we and we have not just you know that's because we have people that come from Kansas City, Liberty, all over. So I mean, so it's a, it's a it's really it's a, it's against the law. You know, the city limits. So. interesting about that graph because it, it's extremely misleading. It is. It is. Mm -hmm. um, many of the breeds they show in there are used with the same stock that's used to breed pit bull type dogs. Um, so a lot of those are variations of pit bull type dogs. A lot of the faces that they show in there are either puppies that are not fully developed, they're awkward angles that don't show the body. Um, essentially it's been decided that an animal control officer looking at any of these breeds could essentially tell the difference between the ones that are shown here 
and a pit bull type dog, with the exception of ones that have the same common stock, such as a doggo or a Latino. Um, I also have that if anyone would like to see it with the other breeds listed. I look at these and I know if I were to approach uh, a backyard and have all of these dogs in that backyard, um, there's a Rottweiler in here. People will call the animal control and say that there's a pit bull running at large when we get there. It's a Doberman, it's a Rottweiler, it's a Boxer. Um, and those breeds are pretty commonly differentiated against. Some of these are the American Bulldog, the Mastiff. Just different bully breeds that aren't technically defined in our ordinances as a pit bull, American Staffordshire Terrier, etc. Um, and it would take the city, at the city's expense, to get the blood and have that DNA test to prove it's a pit bull to ban. The way the city ordinance is written, though, is it includes dogs that have a mix, a mix, or the physical characteristic characteristics of a pit bull type dog. Also, I don't see anywhere where it requires a blood test, and most ordinances and laws don't require blood tests for any reason. If I ask the owner of this dog, what is this dog? They say it's a mastiff, and I think that it looks like it's a bully breed, but a mastiff is also considered a bully breed. Um, then I'm not going to say, I disagree with you. I'm going to, at my expense, have blood drawn and determine that that is a pit bull so that I can cite you and have you from city. Is that part yeah. of the ordinance that they have to be if, DNA tested? No. Anywhere? But it's the burden of proof that that is a pit bull is on the city. But in the order for me to prove that it's a pit bull, I would have to have DNA testing. I but the way just, it's written, I'm not is, a breed professional. I'm not a breed identification professional. But if it looks like a pit bull, the ordinance is written that it's not allowed. A boxer looks like a pit bull to some people. I agree with what you I understand what you're saying. I'm trying to Right. Um, but just because it looks like a pit bull doesn't mean that it is a pit bull. Um, the American Bulldog was not made up. Actually, it is in, most, in a lot of different ordinances. In many ordinances, it is considered a pit bull type dog and is included because it does have, in many lines, a substantial amount of pit bull DNA the characteristics. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and DNA. A lot of them are made with pit bulls. But then again, we go back to DNA, which that is up to the city to, to, to that expenses on the city. I feel like bulldogs should be included and, and they should be written in to the ordinance as it stands. Okay. How is the burden of proof? The burden of proof is of course on the city, as you said, to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. I mean, I assume this has criminal penalties. Pardon? This has a criminal penalty um, to it. Does it have jail time as well? It's it's a municipal, it's a mis, uh, mis uh, <coughs> Yeah, a violation of the city ordinance would be um, penalties could be um, financial or or jail, or jail time. time. Okay, yeah. So you need to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that it is a pit bull dog. How are you going to do that? What procedures do you have in place in Leewood? Um, Leewood didn't have any kind of chart. Their ordinance was vaguely written like yours, um, and we just got it ruled unconstitutional in Johnson County District Court. They said there's no discernible standard here. It is vague as written and vague as applied to my client's dog um, because there is no discernible standard written into the ordinance. And and it's that catch-all language, you know, sure you can say American Staffordshire Terrier, American Pit Bull Terrier, and they may have the breed standard, but when you start mixing in or, I mean, it just, it looks like whoever wrote this was like, I don't know, just anything. That it has short hair, perhaps a blocky head, and um, a thin tail. You know what I mean? It's just, it, and it, so if you take, but if you take the AKC standards and you say, which dogs, even if you had a chart, and you're like, I'm trying to be not vague about enforcing this, I'm going to mark off. You know, I have a 10 point checklist like they do in some jurisdictions. If you get six of these 10 points, then I'm saying it is a pit bull. Then you start ch checking off those checkpoints, you know, rose ears, almond eyes, short hair, prick ears. That first, these breeds that are listed in here can be any color according to the AKC except for the American Staffordshire Terrier is a fault if it's mall. 
And so you start talking about Vislas and Mastiffs and Rottweilers and Water Dogs and Labradors and you just, if you take that checklist, even if you tried to be diligent and not vague in your enforcement, you will end up saying, I have a mixed breed dog here that meets all of these checkpoints and you could run DNA to double check yourself and find out that it has absolutely none of the mentioned breeds in there. So it, the phenotypical traits that come out of, and you know better than I do, are it's, it's the expressive traits of a dog doesn't necessarily mean it's breed. And if you're going to use the AKC breed standard, the AKC is going to tell you, don't use our breed standard. The AKC breed standard is for purebred dogs. It is a standard in which to measure dogs we already know are purebred dogs. It is not to discern if a mixed breed dog is a purebred dog nor is it to be used as their general counsel to enforce breed-specific legislation. And I think, too, this ordinance, this definition of the was written in 1987, originally. So, and I think at the time, it was a national headline about pit bulls and every mauling and every bite and every case was national news because it was um, a scare tactic. I don't know. It was just a very common... Trend at the time to report on all of the dangerous pitbull attacks nationwide, and I think that this ordinance was um, also written. I heard that it came to be as a result of an incident in, in town, but also it was a national trend at the time. And this is a 1987 definition that you're reading, and it hasn't been changed since. So. I would argue that there are several court cases. Um, that have happened where they ruled that pit bulls, the term, is not unconstitutionally void for vagueness, such as Toledo versus Tellings, uh, 2007 in Ohio with the Supreme Court. Um, they say that they believe that the physical and behavioral traits of pit bulls together with the commonly available knowledge of dog breeds typically acquired by potential dog owners or otherwise possessed by veterinarians or breeders are sufficient to inform a dog owner as to whether or not he owns a dog commonly known as a pit bull. They have also mentioned that a um, dog owner of reasonable intelligence can tell you if a dog is a pit bull type dog or not. They say that the pit bull has certain phenotypical characteristics in its appearance which allow this breed to be identical, identifiable. Um, there are several court cases in various states all the way up to the state supreme laws that seem to concur with this belief. It's really fun, the Tellings case was back in 2007 and that was way before DNA testing. Um, so what's neat about that is what we've been able to do and see from veterinarians, shelter med veterinarians, public safety experts is they've been able to take what animal welfare professionals, whether it's an animal control officer, uh, animal shelter worker, a veterinarian, um, any rescue people, um, and they've done studies. There have been four published scientific studies, one in Java, um, and it says if we take what you say, you look at this dog and you're an animal welfare professional, you encounter tens of thousands of dogs in your career, and you feel confident that you can identify the predominant breed of a mixed breed dog, and they've asked them to identify the breeds and then they run a DNA test. There is such a low occurrence in uh, co-occurrence and agreement of these, all these animal welfare professionals that it's, it's statistically significant that it is next to impossible to identi visually identify the predominant breed of a mixed breed dog accurately. So we didn't even know that when the Tellings case came out. Um, and it was presented in the Leewood case in Johnson County. And when the judge considered that information, he said, you know what, with all the science that we have now, I do find that this is very different than the Hearn case, which was in Overland Park in 1989. This is very different than the Tellings case. This is very different than the New Mexico case. We have science now that says you actually can't. The, a reasonable person actually can't be on notice of what kind of dog that they have and, and if it is prohibited in the city. So I, I think that's worth making note. 
there have been exponential advancements in dog behavior analysis and the science behind identifying breeds of dogs, particularly mixed breeds, and, and I just think it's absolutely worth noting that that has come just in the last few years. come through from um, the outside audience and one pertains to I'm not going to do that I'm going to do the one you showed me earlier the has to whether or not animal control has the resources to support the ordinance as it's written now and you both have said there were things that you would do differently or would like to see tightened up so it would be much easier to do the job support animals, service dogs, that needs to be tightened up. Um, I know that that's a very that's a touchy I'm happy subject. To talk about okay. It. <laughs> um, so so there's that. Um, like you said, I mean DNA testing, I, there's there's just so many different things that would um, if it's written if, if we enforce it right now, I mean, we're gonna have to have probably more people to to help us enforce it. Right. Because it's <laughs> they're here. I mean, it's, I mean, they're they're living in our city limits and things like that. So it is case by case basis. So I'm happy to do that. But, and yep. I would like to see the dangerous dog ordinance written so that there's not any gray area. Um, it is black and white, this or that, and there's no question about what we expect from a uh, dog owner about their dog's behavior. So that way we can write that ordinance and it's going to stick as it goes through the court system. Was there any response that you wanted to talk about that? I, it sounds like we're, it's finding easy ways that we are agreeing. And one is we want our community to be safe from dogs that are, um, are expressing themselves to be dangerous to a person. And that we want our ordinance to be um, sophisticated enough to allow the animal control officers to do a good job when they encounter a situation between the dog, the dog's owner, and whoever might be um, being threatened by the animal. We have one more question. The question that's coming from online is asking, how do you determine uh, whether it is a pit bull? I think you've all said that there are DNA tests that are being used. Um, Greg and I talked about it a little earlier. It's not unusual for homeowners to have their dog tested because it is sort of a fun thing to get the results for. And one of our acquaintances had their dog tested. I think it came back with six, maybe six different possible breeds, different percentages, which would not be uncommon. And even then, so what constitutes a pit bull at that point? 51%? Is it 10%? But the way the ordinance is written, it's just really... 80%. Yeah. The way it is now. Enforcement now for, if I have to go to someone's house, and I recently did, the complaint was the dog was running at large. So I go knock on the door, and there's a dog in the house that looks to me to be of a bully breed. She didn't let him out. The dog around back that was that was chained up was the one that's running at large. But when I asked her for information about her dogs to make sure that they were run on rabies and had their city license, her response was, it's a mix. And she didn't let him out of the house. And I said, well, you need to provide me with his proof of rabies and a city license, regardless of what dog you have on the other side of the door. But I think she's afraid to tell me that that's a pit bull mix. Um, and so that's how I would, that's how I would approach that. If she said, this dog is a pit bull mix, then I can address, okay, the owner has told me it's a pit bull mix. Here is your information. Pit bulls are banned. Here's your ticket or here's your 24 hour, 48 hour notice to remove the dog from city limits. It's a case by case basis. So that would be how we would handle that call had she been forthcoming with the breed. But because she wasn't, I gave her time to provide me with current rabies and city tags. like to say or needs to be kind of expanded upon? Angela? 
just this month in news reports, there have been 75, 75, yes, 75 as of earlier today, attacks and fatalities from pit bull type dogs, including seven fatalities on humans in the last month. I don't, that is, that's, that's worldwide, yes, uh, worldwide, yes, that is worldwide. Um, a lot of these did happen in the U.S., many of them happened in the U.K. We had two fatalities today from pit bull type dogs um, in the South Americas. There are a lot of stories that I don't think we should be subjecting our residents to. Um, there was a case, this happened in December, um, but they've been reporting on it recently. There was a woman named Jacqueline Durand who decided to dog sit a pit bull and a German Shepherd. She ended up in the hospital for two months with over 800 dog bites. Her entire face is putty at this point. Is she the dog sitter? She was the dog sitter, yeah. Um, they ate her nose, her eye, well, her nose, part of her eyes, basically everything under her eyes was gone. I don't feel like that's a risk we should be handing to our citizens. We have the case of Jaden um, Henderson, seven-year-old girl, was killed by her neighbors, two pit bulls. One was a fight dog that was adopted out by the city because being a fight dog no longer gets you put down, it gets you adopted out. Um, but she was killed by her neighbor's dog, one of which was an ESA, one of which was a service dog with six months of training. Um, the owners fought the city to get the dog back. They had a couple months worth of legal fights there. The dogs were eventually euthanized. Um, they had Instagrams, petitions. They raised thousands of dollars from Pitbull supporters. Ended up with a new $65,000 car. They are now currently working with other rescues to foster Pitbulls. They're currently entered in a contest for America's Best Pet to win $5,000 with their pit bulls. Um, we have the case in Oklahoma where a one-year-old was disfigured. He is looking at surgery after surgery after surgery. He was completely scalped. His teeth were pulled out of his head. Um, he's looking at ridiculous amounts of money. Most Americans, and especially people in Excelsior, cannot afford those medical bills. Most homeowners insurances do not cover pit bull type dogs. You're looking at, I think the average bite was 18,000 and some odd dollars out of pocket for a regular hospital stay and that's not even close to what some of these people are looking at. There's no point in going after the pit bull dog owners because most of them will not have that money if you see them. We have cases from various medical journals peer-reviewed studies, all of which say that pit bull type dogs are more dangerous than most other types, especially to children and elderly. Um, and this isn't just your neighbor's dog, this is a lot of household dogs, um, but they say that they tend to do the most damage when they bite. It's not that they necessarily bite more than other dogs, that's not what BSL is for. Breed specific legislation is not intended for your garden variety dog bites from a collie. It's intended for level five and level six bites on the Dunbar scale, which are catastrophic. Um, but if anyone wants to read this, I've got several pages. Um, they actually include, I know we referenced the AVMA, the American Veteran Medical Association, which um, was pointed out earlier that they don't recommend breed specific legislation. However, in their study in 2000, they mentioned fatal attacks on humans appear to be a breed-specific problem to pit bull type dogs and Rottweilers. And then we also see, I know a lot of people love their animals. A lot of people are dog lovers in here. Pit bull type dogs kill more type of animals than all other dogs combined. Um, one study that I am looking at say that they killed 90% uh, 96% of dogs who were killed by other animals in 2018 were killed by pit bulls. Um, 
86% of cats. It says that essentially one pit bull in 90 killed an animal or a human. In comparison, only one in 45,000 dogs of other breeds killed something in that same year. So I would say as an animal lover, this is not something we want in our town. Uh, and if we look, I know Denver recently repealed their pit bull laws. On the same night that they repealed their pit bull ban, there were one, there were three people that were killed by pit bulls across the country. And since then, their dog bite rates from pit bulls have gone through the roof. It's only been a year, um, but now pit bulls are leading the pit bull attack or the dog bites in the city and have substantially more serious bites than all other ones. Um, it appears that they had 34 minor scratches, 60 level 3 bites, 12 level 4 bites, and I can't tell what number that is on the last one. Um, with German Shepherds and Labrador Retrievers substantially behind that. They are saying that proponents for legalization downplay the numbers and question the data collection. Um, but it looks like they had three to four level five attacks um, in one city within one year. Which I have the data from the previous three years and the numbers, they had five within three years before that and the numbers were much smaller. In addition, I have a list of various preemption laws, so states that basically bar ordinances from having BSL, um, and the numbers for all of those states seem to increase dramatically once they've banned ordinances from enacting BSL. Um. I just, you referenced the Dunbar scale. Yes. When you do a dog bite investigation, where do you report the level of bite on the Dunbar scale? I've never, I've never. No. I, I'm curious how that data is collected when I'm not actually aware of any city that requires pulling the Dunbar scale bite and reporting it anywhere. Unfortunately, a lot of what was read is reported in the media. All of this is rebuttable, and I am not really sure where to start other than probably the fact that dog bites and dog bite related fatalities are scary. I think that this is a serious problem. It is something that people need to be aware of, um, but our communities respectfully need to be aware of what causes dog bite related fatalities. And the research shows that it is not breed and it is not appearance. There is a co-occurrence of factors. Over a 10 year study that was published after the 2000 study in JAMA, there was a 10 year study done on dog bite related fatalities, which however horrific are incredibly rare um, so before we f feel threatened by all the dogs in our neighborhood, it's really important to know that there are about 30 a year. Those are horrific and tragic, but those dog bite related fatalities are not common. When they studied the dog bite related fatalities, they didn't rely on media reports as what was read this evening. They, they relied on looking back and investigating current and, and tag along with the current investigations with animal control, the police department, and coroners. What they found was there were a co-occurrence of factors in 85% of all dog bite related fatalities, I think it was 238, over a period of 10 years. Those co-occurrence of factors included how the animal was maintained in the home and with the family, whether or not the animal was socialized, and incredibly, that male dogs were more likely to attack and kill. Do you think we should ban all male dogs? No, there's a reason for that. And if you talk to any 
behaviorists, animal behaviorists, they will tell you it's because male dogs, uh, intact male dogs are more likely to run. So they're more likely to be out roaming around, more likely to have those off-property encounters and bites and aggressive incidents with people. So we have to peel back the layers of why is this happening instead of saying the media says it's all pit bulls and so we need to ban them. When you really drill down and you look at the science and you talk to people doing the autopsies, you talk to the coroners and you talk to veterinarians and you do the DNA tests on these dogs who are causing fatalities, there was not one single breed that rose to the top of causing these fatalities. And so that is the most recent study on dog bite related fatalities. Those co-occurrence of factors is what Excelsior Springs, in my opinion, should be looking at legislating. Um, just real quick with regard to the 2000 Journal of American Veter Veterinary Mal Medical Association that was published, it was a study that was done from 1978 to 1996 and they studied dog bite reports in the media. Um, there was no retrospective in-depth investigation um, and as a result of that, the CDC and the American Veterinary Medical Association put out a disclaimer that says this should never be relied upon to interpret any breed specific risk. So whatever it concluded in 2000, the authors of that study, the individuals, the veterinarians and the publishers of that study have said do not rely on this study that's not good science and we know that now. Who, who was that first study done by, was that the Canine Research Council that did the big study you were talking about, or who, who did that study? The National Canine Research Council. Which is owned by Pit Lobby. It is owned by animal organizations. It is not actually a research council. In other countries, they don't even admit that information into their uh, legislation. I, I had one question from online. And basically, they're asking, what is defined as a pit bull in our ordinance? Um, our pit bull dog definition includes a Staffordshire pit, um, bull terrier breed of dog, the American pit bull terrier breed of dog, dogs of mixed breed or other breeds that above listed which breed or mixed breed is known as pit bulls, pit bull dogs or pit bull terriers, any dog which has the appearance and characteristics of being predominantly of the breeds of the Staffordshire Pit Terrier, American Pit Bull Terrier, American Staffordshire Terrier, and any other breed commonly known as Pit Bulls, Pit Bull Dogs, or Pit Bull Terriers, or a combination of any of these breeds. Um, the second question that I had was, um, is, th is there scientific proof that pit bull breed dogs are more dangerous. Questions for anyone? I would say that there are with these medical studies. There are several of them conducted from 2000, or no, from 1989 till 2021, and each study says that pit bull type dogs inflict more damage, they attack in more places, they tend to bite in more, um, because more important places, they bite the neck, they bite the head, um, and they have a different type of biting style than most other dogs. Uh, most dogs do a bite and release. Pit bull type dogs do not. They were created for bull baiting, for catching bulls by the face and attacking them, and then eventually they were used for dog biting afterwards. They were never created as family pets. Um, and so whenever pit bull type dogs tend to attack, they grab on, they hold, and they shake, which causes a lot of tissue damage. It causes huge, huge wounds in comparison to a regular dog that lets go. I agree with some of the things that you're saying. Um, some of the pit bull bites that are on record have been horrific deaths have occurred and damage has been done that people will never recover from. They're going to be scarred or maimed for life. Um, but I also have to say that I've been bitten by a pit bull at the shelter, two dog bites, and both were bite and release. I wasn't shook, I wasn't mauled, I wasn't um, scarred for life. And 
was just a fight and release. Um, it needs to be said that there are people who have a fear of the pit bull breed, and they live here in Excelsior Springs. These dogs do put people in fear. Um, and I think our ordinances do address that we're not to be keeping dogs to put people in fear. Um, and there is a natural anxiety of, of, about pit bulls from the general public. Um, and it could be that they've had a personal experience. It could be that they read a news article or saw something on TV. Um, so that has to be understood among pro and con pit bull advocates because it, they do put people in fear. Also, that being said, as an animal control officer, I typically am not going to have to knock on the doors of responsible pet parents. I'm going to be knocking on doors of people that are being complained about. So do I want to knock on doors where the dog on the other side is a public nuisance? Not really. And I don't want that to be my primary focus every day where I have to go out and now because the ban has been lifted, there's an influx of pit bulls that's going to put my life in danger. So that's as far as doing the job. Do I want to see the ban lifted? Not really. Um, but I'm not a citizen of Excelsior Springs. I don't live inside the city limits. Um, and I'll do whatever job I need to do. Um, but I don't support breed-specific legislation. So it's kind of a six this way, half a dozen this way, yes over here, no over here, for just about any person. They are, there's a pro and a con. And I think they all need to be looked at. I just feel like, you know, um, we do have other dangerous dog laws in place. But the problem with those laws are that they're reactionary. They're not preventative. You guys mentioned earlier that sometimes you have dogs that bite that go back into the public. They come back, they, they get a bite more than once. And when you have a pit bull type dog, those are zero error dogs. If those bite, I mean, maybe you'll get lucky and you'll get a release. Maybe you won't next time. Maybe next time it's gonna be a six year old kid who gets attacked by their neighbor's dog. There's no way to police who has these dogs. There's no way to police who's a good owner, who's not a good owner, how they're raised. Um, and I just don't think we should be taking the risk by allowing them in the first place when we really don't have to. We don't need to take that risk. The people who have pit bulls now are already breaking the dangerous dog, law, dangerous dog laws and I don't think that we could trust them to stick to the other dangerous dog laws. They already don't respect the ordinances in place. And in addition, you don't know where these dogs are coming from. Most dogs are coming from shelters, and shelters anymore, um, a lot of them are ran by animal rights organizations, not really people who are for public safety. A lot of these dogs are coming in with bite histories, whether or not that's known by the shelters or not. They're still being released. Um, Best Friends Animal Society right now, and they have a shelter in LA. They have litigation pending against them for essentially adopting out dogs that they know have violent propensities that have attacked people that they have adopted out to families with children. Those dogs have attacked again and they're being adopted out again. Um, many of these dogs are being trafficked from state to state um, in order to lose their paper trails of their violent propensities because we're in a no-kill society for many of these shelters. They get funded by not euthanizing the animals whether or not that means that the public safety is compromised. So one of the things I've heard everyone say tonight, that one of the most effective things that we could do is write a good ordinance. That it needs to be something that can be easily enforced by our staff. And whatever that those ingredients are, that that is something that sounds has come across from what I've heard you all say is would be the most important thing we could do. Could you all speak to um, how you feel about the ability to enforce an ordinance and what that looks like for the staff who have to make judgment calls when they're uh, arriving on a situation? Katie, could you maybe just comment on the, the trend legally sure. on ordinances? I know a lot of municipalities have gotten away from the breach specific language. What types of ordinances, if any, are they putting them in replace of those that maybe would have some teeth toward dangerous dogs, but not specifically directed towards uh, a breed? 
Yeah, I mean, obviously, the reason cities enact breed specific legislation is because they are under the assumption that it will prevent any dangerous dog attacks. Don't have them in the city, then we won't have any dog attacks, and it's preemptive. What you can do is look at actual factors, um, actual dangerous dog behavior um, that put your community at risk. Um, those co-occurrence of factors, like we said, uh, there's no there's no easy way to, to do it. It has to be a comprehensive, humane enforcement mechanism. Those, those dogs that are being kept not as family pets and they have no socialization it's tough because like so long as they have food and water like what are you going to do right but there are ways that you can enforce that when you mean are ensuring that those animals are getting exercise and we're not even talking about dangerous and your dangerous animal section we're talking about the humane care of animals section right now then you start talking about um you know what it looks like when dogs are constantly getting off the property or dogs that are chasing and what you have here is a good start um, chasing passing vehicles chasing people getting off the property multiple times those are reckless pet owners those are actual behaviors that have <coughs> occurred and that you can say i have a complainant i have a, an incident that occurred and i can do something about this you can say after an x number of convictions citations and convictions then this is a nuisance animal, and we're gonna actually put a restriction on you keeping this animal. You know, it, it, when it's out, it needs to be muzzled, it needs to be on a leash, if it's not, then maybe we're gonna say, we call this a dangerous dog. And it, there are just so many things that you can do, but this little public nuisance language that you have is a good, good start. So what, usually what cities do is they say, we have a, a nuisance animal section, those are those behaviors that are indicative of um, future dangerous behavior or a future bite. And they, they start to pay more attention to that animal, put that animal on the radar through citations. I'm, it's not easy. I mean, you have to have a comprehensive understanding of what you're doing. You have to have a good tracking database for convictions. You have to communicate with your municipal court about which animals have been convicted so you can put them on your list. So when you issue a new citation, you can say, this is your third citation. You are now a reckless pet owner or your animal is now a nuisance animal. It's not easy, but it can be done. Yeah, we were um, talking about that today, some of the challenges and uh, things that we need to put in place uh, to be able to do that. Yeah, really targeting repeat offenders. Then you have something that escalates to a dangerous animal. That animal has exhibited some kind of dangerous behavior, inflicted a bite wound on a person, or has attacked or killed another animal. Um, and then that is a dangerous animal. You have restrictions, very similar to the restrictions that you have here, except for here you don't have any actual behavior. It's just if it's a big dog with teeth, could be, you know, could be a dangerous dog the way it's written, um, and have all these restrictions on it. And I don't know how successful you've been in proving that in court, um, but you know, that's, that's the next step. You have an actual action a dog has taken. And, and that happens, we can't prevent it. It's, it's, it's so hard. If we could, if there was a magic bullet language or something, I, I, we would all get behind it. Um, but, but once an action is taken, then you can punish and restrict that dog or that person. And then you can also escalate it to a vicious animal ordinance that says, hey, this attack was severe in nature. It, the person had to get medical treatment. Um, or it kills another animal, however you want to make those definitions and say, you got to, it's euthanized or get it out of town. Um, and so having those different levels and attacking the behavior instead of um, these really vague um, definitions is, is the trend in the International Municipal Lawyers Association, Association, like I said, there's some pulled from all, all cities all across the country to figure out what would work best. And that's kind of what, what they did. In addition to all of that, you can also have a reckless pet owner, and that could be someone who's your repeat offender, who, you know, there's like five households in every city that are repeat offenders. It doesn't matter if it's neglect, cruelty, dangerous animals, um, you know, over the pet limit, new odor, noise, nuisance, there are irresponsible pet owners. And, and targeting those repeat offenders and saying, hey, after a certain number of convictions, you can't have animals anymore. Like, we can't keep coming back here 
you are not suited to own a pet constitutionally um, I haven't seen a challenge yet I think there's some questions around taking someone's pet away you can maybe prevent them from having pets in the future um, so but there are convictions in municipal court where they can say you, we're taking this pet away because you're endangering its safety or you're endangering public safety once there's a conviction there are a myriad of options do you have anything to add to that that was quite a lot <laughs> No, well, I also think our, our, our position within the community for um, abuse has also changed over the years. It used to be that, I mean, these dogs, you really, they had to be in bad shape before we could intervene and say, this has got to stop. And that's not the case anymore. I mean, at, at this point, um, we have been encouraged, if we see an animal that's coming through the door, that we feel like, Care is not adequate, be that weight, be that, you know, the, you know whatever that we see physically that might see, um, you know, that could also be reported to be put on the radar that we need to be watching these people. And I would say, too, with the shelter, um, in terms of adopting out uh, dogs that have a bite history, um, it's not happening. You know, we're very, you know, have, we, we just are very careful about those dogs that are in the, that have been presented for a bite, either an animal or a person. Um, they might get a second chance in that home, but routinely they're not getting a second chance in another location. And I believe that about Excelsior Shelter, absolutely. but. There are a lot of shelters out there outside of Excelsior that are not, uh, not as more, but not as ethical. Right. And we don't know where these dogs are coming from. We don't know if they're coming from Casey Pet Project. We don't know if they're coming from a backyard breeder. We don't know where they're coming from. We have no idea what their histories are. We don't know if they have a bite history. You know, in Kansas, we know nothing about these dogs. I, yeah, I certainly agree. There's no state reporting agency that that collects every single bite. Bites are not often reported when they're in the home um, and they don't cause severe damage. There's no state repository, which further calls into question any kind of data that espouses that pit bulls bite more than any other animal in certain states or whatever. There's just, there's not a lot of data around this. And and I think that there's, there's, there's fear in the unknown. Of course, there, there's fear in, in not knowing the history of an animal that comes into your city. There's fear in the unknown of adopting a dog with unknown parentage and history. I don't think you legislate that. That's, that's inappropriate legislation. How many people have just gotten their dog off the street? Or what should we... I don't know what the proposal to that to satisfy that fear or make us feel more comfortable is that we don't adopt out shelter dogs anymore. We don't adopt out dogs that are mixed breed dogs. I mean, I'm not really sure how to how to make your position feel more comfortable other than to say, so long as we know the parents of this dog and they're purebred dogs and you've purchased it from a reputable breeder that is license and those are the only dogs we're going to have in our community. Um, yikes, that's just, it's too bad, first of all, because, you know, there are so many shelter dogs out there that have never done anything. Again, fatal attacks and severe attacks are incredibly rare. Um, so legislating that is inappropriate. dog ordinance and really beef up everything, kind of go through, you know, the definitions, what we can and can't do, um, tiers of, of, you know, 
Is this your first offense? Is this your second offense? What can we do legally to make sure this never happens again? Um, euthanizing the dog, taking away the dog, having it removed from city limits, is that responsible also? <coughs> so um, if it's a dangerous animal, I will also say having this specific um, breed ban, we've came across dogs we never knew that were behind other doors until something happens. Maybe it's their owner, and then we have to go in and we have to take out their dog, and oh, it's a pit bull, and oh, they're going to give us a fight. Um, so I will say, just because we have a ban doesn't mean that, there, that that criminal element isn't gonna sneak in, so. Um, and I think it just becomes so much, and it is overwhelming, um, along with her. If there is anything that I can say to take away the fear of, of a dog attack, a surprise attack, I think that we all should always have our head on a swivel, no matter where we're at, no matter what dog is, is, is running loose. And then on the other hand, with lifting this breed specific legislation, we need to be responsible. If you choose to have any breed of animal, you need to be responsible and you need to be respectful of your neighbors. Um, you need to know the consequences of what's going to happen. You need to understand that this dog that might be perfect for your home, when it's out and it's left to its own devices, it can become a public nuisance that is going to be dangerous and the dog's the one that's going to have to pay for it ultimately. Any other thoughts? I don't. I don't want to take this on for two hours. If we feel like we've covered the subject, or if there were things that you felt we've been able to say, um, and really the next step for the city council is to make a decision about what our ordinance will say. So, what would be final words if if there's not a lot left to say that you would like to share? I just want to piggyback real quick on what. Katie was referencing in terms of developing your ordinances. You already have a base set of ordinances that set the expectation of how animals are to be kept in your community. Arguably, that's your preventative measure, right? We expect people to keep their dogs contained. We expect that they're not going to run at large. And then to Katie's point, you want to build into your ordinances opportunities to address behaviors that become nuisance, and then behaviors that escalate to a public safety risk. An animal running at large is not inherently a public safety risk. An animal running at large chasing people down the street, knocking people off bicycles, is a public safety risk, but we're talking about two different elevations of action. And so, in looking at your ordinances and any sort of revision you're looking to do, I would make sure that you build in opportunity for your animal control officers to adequately enforce and be able to, to prosecute around the different levels of action that you're seeing. So that if we have animal owners that are acting irresponsibly, because when you have animals exhibiting nuisance behaviors, often it's a, it's a human behavior issue more than it's an animal behavior issue. So we want to equip your officers with the tools to address that human behavior issue. Uh, typically in, in our program and programs that, that I've worked in throughout my career, we want to always take an engagement focused approach first. Because what we want is to affect a behavioral change. So we want to deliver information and resources. We want for people to be equipped and feel empowered around making the right choice. Sometimes people don't know. Sometimes they do, and they need a little encouragement. And then sometimes they just don't know for whatever reason, right? And so we want to make sure that your officers are equipped with all the things that they need so that they can address the behaviors that they're seeing. Because sometimes it's just as simple. You guys, you guys know you're out there working it. Sometimes it's as simple as a conversation. But sometimes you have to use other tools in your toolbox, and those are your citations, those are your ordinances, to you know, enact labels that add additional restrictions to the animals that you in these animals. So I guess part of my point is don't lose sight of the, what you're trying to accomplish. You're trying to create a community that is safe for everyone. 
we all have a right to walk down the street and not be uh, harassed or nuisanced or chased by a dog. We all want that. Even those of us that are dog lovers, right? We all want to feel safe in our communities. And so it's about addressing the actions that we either want to see or don't want to see. And it's not about the breed because the breed doesn't predict the behavior. Oh, now it's your turn. I think I've talked quite enough this evening. Um, I would just offer, if you have an idea of where you want to go with it, I am happy to send over multiple ordinances and hook you up with other animal control agencies in those jurisdictions so you can say, hey, how is this working? I mean, I know it's tough in one jurisdiction in which I represent animal control for them to enforce that nuisance section because they don't have a good reporting relationship with their municipal court. So they can issue all the citations they want, but they never know how it escalates because they can't get the reports from the court. You know, so there may be there may be really great ordinance language, but it may be really hard to enforce. Um, it may not be practical for Excelsior Springs. Maybe it's practical for a different city, but may not be practical for you. So I would just love to facilitate any conversations um, your city wants in in making this huge decision. Um, and, and template ordinances and, and give you all the information kind of like this listening session and let you make a decision that's best for your community. Well, I look at the ordinance and it's 35 years old and I think that's there's things in here that need addressed. And, and however the help comes, I think it's obvious. Having worked at the shelter for 40 years, where the shelter is today and where it was four years ago is there's, there's a remarkable difference in the facility that we have, uh, the number of animals that are coming through it compared to what it used to be like. So we've made some really positive steps forward. And I think the ordinance, however it turns out, you have two animal control officers, you know, you have to have an ordinance that they can have the resources to enforce. And there are going to be limitations So we have to have something that they can handle. I mean, that they can do. It. But uh, from where we are, again, where we started to now, it's like light years difference. Yeah, just along those same lines, uh, as one who represents the organization that's responsible for enforcing the ordinances, uh, we want a good ordinance. We, we don't want a poorly written one that um, constitutionally probably couldn't pass muster. Um, so I, obviously we want the community to be safe and, and not encounter nuisance, dangerous dogs. Um, so we would support reasonable legislation that we could actually enforce. Um, I agree, we do need um, be here clause. I would like to see if that animal control doesn't return dogs that bite, period, back into our society or our community. Um, that's one of the things I would like to see changed. I still believe that um, ESL has served Excelsior well and would con continue to do so by preventing the more serious attacks. Um, but I would like to see it improved overall even outside of free legislation. Well, thank, thank you very much, everybody that was able to come. And uh, Mackenzie will tell, tell you there were several comments that we tried to work in, but um, really do appreciate everybody taking some time tonight and sharing your thoughts. And it's helpful for us as, as we consider what the next steps are. Appreciate it. Thank you for having us.